tokens of our faith, my lord, and lead us from the darkness. Fire! I save you well! Lord of light, show us the way. Those are the stars that guide us. Lord of light, protect us! For the night is dark and full of terrors! Beginning of this season, we come upon Stannis having gone full Melisandre. He's definitely thrown in all of his bets with her, and he's burning people who refuse to acknowledge her God and her way of doing things. So I would say that what started as a, a practical thing for Stannis has become more than that. He certainly has seen that Melisandre's power is real. You know, he's seen that she. Um, is capable of, of birthing a shadow demon that will eliminate, you know, one of his enemies. Um, he's seen that she's capable of throwing leeches in the fire and in that way apparently bumping off several more of his opponents. Um, he's a very practical man. I don't think he cares so much about uh, matters of theology. He just cares about winning this war and being installed as, as the king and sitting on the Iron Throne. And Melisandre seems to him his best chance. And if that means using black magic, so be it. If that means worshiping the Lord of Light, then so be it. He wants his birthright, is obsessed with his birthright. And this is, as far as he can see it, the only way he's ever going to get what is coming to him. So he's now going to try things her way. And this is a, a pretty brutal, ugly way of letting everybody know where he stands on the Lord of Light front. Hold on. Take me to the tree. When Bran touches the weirwood tree, he gets a sort of a coming attraction of the full breadth and power of, of the sight that he has, and, and it's sort of telling him what's coming down the road for him once he truly masters this ability. Of course, he doesn't know what they all mean because they're all mixed and jumbled together. And every image in there does, you know, was there, it's there for a reason and it, it does bear, have some bearing on his story specifically and the story in general going forward. There were certain key images that we really wanted to see, you know, so whether it's a shot of Ned Stark in the black cells below the Red Keep in the time before his execution that Bran could not have seen, um, whether it's a shot of Bran falling, you know, from a, a perspective he couldn't have seen it, or maybe the most crucial shot to us was the shadow of a dragon flying over King's Landing. And we don't know yet, you know, is that a, from the past? Is it from the future? We'll find out, but uh, it's, it's not clear yet, and nor should it be clear to Bran. But the one thing that does make sense is that someone's trying to guide him, and that someone is opening his eyes to a very specific destination, and that's where he's going to find his destiny. I know where we have to go. The scene as a whole is, is one of the most challenging sequences we've ever done, because it's it involves more of our principal characters than we've ever had together in the same place before, maybe more than we'll ever have together again. With a show as huge as this one, with so many different plot lines and different characters, it's kind of a rare opportunity. So we were really looking forward to that, to a chance to, you know, what would Brienne and Cersei talk about if they ran into each other? And if Loras happened to bump into Jamie, literally, what would that conversation be like? And Oberyn and Cersei meeting, or Hilaria Sand and Cersei meeting, how would that go? So, so much of the wedding is, is a chance for that, which we always think is fun, you know, to get characters who aren't normally joined together to see how they would interact. And it's all playing out in real time, and it's a real testament to Alex Graves and Annette Helmick, his, his cinematographer, that they were able, it was a kind of a master class they gave us on how to shoot a big ensemble scene where everyone is in the right place at the right time and, and everyone's actions make sense even when the cameras aren't on them. And obviously it's all centered around Joffrey since it's his wedding. It's a real gift to anybody directing the show because obviously the stories are so complicated and intertwined and now suddenly you're in a 30 page sequence where it's all, almost all, going on with uh, uh, a large number of cast members for once and they're not separate. And so I wanted to create a very tight flow so that People are seeing each other across the way, not seeing each other across the way, having their little beat and transitioning into other things. My lords, my ladies, I give you King Joffrey, Renly, Stannis, Rob Stark, Balon Greyjoy, the war of the five kings. That whole 
bit of the wedding. It's all what Joffrey wanted, you know, and so it's in terrible taste, and everything's in terrible taste. It's just so funny to Joffrey and so completely unfunny to so many other people up there. Uncle, how about you? I'm, I'm sure they have a spare costume. <laughs> we wanted very much to have the whole sequence leading up to Joffrey's demise tell us one last time exactly who Joffrey is. And it doesn't matter that this is his wedding and this is his day. I mean, every, everybody's king at their wedding for a day, and this is Joffrey's wedding. So he can do whatever he wants. Nobody can say a word about it. And he uses that power to try to humiliate his uncle in front of everybody who's anybody in Westeros. The, the key thing for me in directing that part of the sequence is that you know Peter's going to be incredible at dealing with the situation he's in. You know that Jack is going to be beautifully evil. And my worry was that I steer it towards something really bad is going to happen. I don't understand what it is, but I know it's coming. I said, Neil! Look, the pie! Marjorie was basically looking forward to a lifetime of trying to handle this guy and uh, knowing full well this kid is a psychopath and that he's going to be doing a lot of bad things and the best she can hope for is to uh, control him a little bit. She certainly can't control him forever, but maybe she can kind of tamp down his, his baser instincts. You know, it's kind of a hopeless task. It's far too late for, for Joffrey. I mean, he's past the point of therapy. No one's going to make him into a good kid or a good king, but, um, but she's game. I mean, Marjorie is not fearful. She was willing to give it a go. <coughs> he's choking! I'm the poor boy! <coughs> Idiots, help your king! Wait! Jack is such an incredible actor and young man and is so lovable and everybody's crazy about him that you just wanted to go, how great can we make this? And, and he, I think, had a great time and uh, was fantastic in it. I think between Jack and Lena, these are two not particularly pleasant people, but in the moment of his death, their characters sort of fall away and... He becomes just a terrified child who's looking to his mother for help, and she becomes the worst thing in the world anyone can imagine. There's a mother who's unable to help her son as he's dying in her arms, and they really they bring out the underlying humanity in these characters that I think in the hands of, of lesser actors could so easily turn into just evil stereotypes and, and could make Joffrey's death a purely triumphal moment for the audience, and I really don't think it is in the version of it that, that Jack and Lena have given us. It was really fun filming all the different things that are going while he's dying because it's so many different things, so many different places, but, you know, Sansa is pulled into her escape. Tyrion is wondering what's going on and assuming the goblet had something to do with it. Cersei is experiencing her child dying in front of her. Tywin is realizing that someone has taken out a hit on a family member in public. Oberyn seems to know a lot about poison, so is he a suspect? Um, and we're really worried about everybody, give or take, and who had what part to play in it. He poisoned my son, your king. Traditionally, you know, the seasons are kind of slow builds, and the episodes towards the end, obviously, are the climactic ones, and the early episodes building up to them, and we thought it'd be fun to shake it up a little bit this time and, and have something very dramatic happen quite early, and also just knowing that we needed so much of the season to deal with the aftermath. It was an episode we, we've been looking forward to for a long time. I don't think there's ever been an actor who has played a character less like himself than Jack Gleason. He is the sweetest, loveliest, most excellent person you could ever want to know so it's uh, the joy in watching Joffrey die on screen be that as it may for the people watching the the sadness that everybody on the production felt at the thought that Jack wasn't going to be on the show anymore was a was a real a real hit for everybody it's a very difficult person for us to let go he's been such a defining part of the show from the very very first episode with no 